So just a brief introduction on the, the topics of the talk today and how we're going to go about it. First of all, we'll have a, a quick look at the sources of nickel because the sources of nickel dictates how you process nickel and how you process nickel dictates what you can do with it to some extent. Uh, so we'll look at the key deposit types, the regional breakdown and the constraints and risks around that. Uh, we'll have a look at the, the current economics of the nickel market, uh, historic production, demand and price and the present drivers of construction. And then we'll look at the changing nickel marketplace, and we've already had some hints of this today in various presentations, and in particular the impact of electric vehicles and what is that going to do to nickel as a market. And uh, finally, we'll have a look at some sources of futures of supply to see how we meet that changing demand. So firstly, the sources of nickel. Uh, the USGS uh, estimates there's something like 95 million tonnes of contained nickel in resources around the world. Now, a caution, that's not all economic. This includes everything from jaw compliant proven reserves to dodgy numbers scribbled on the back of a beer mat. So, but of that, something like 6% of those resources are contained in laterite resources and 40% of that contained in sulphide nickel deposits. And we can see that uh, some of the, the countries that we typically associate with uh, nickel are very heavily represented on that graph. So what are laterite deposits? Essentially, that's a result of chemical weathering of ultramafic rocks that contain olivine, uh, nickel-rich mineral, at the Earth's surface and the concentration of that nickel through the weathering process into economic quantities. Uh, typically, it's a well-known distribution of where these deposits are. The laterite deposits globally are fairly well understood in where they are, where to find them, and how much of them there currently are. There's not a lot of room for exploration upside and discovery of new deposits. Uh, they are fairly easy mining, open pit, essentially scrape them out of the ground, no blasting required. Uh, but they are capital intensive and as we've seen with the HPL operations around the world up until today, they have had a very high degree of capital risk involved with them as well, with budget overruns, very significant budget overruns. Uh, typical nickel laterite profile and where we sit in this laterite profile, as I said, um, largely dictates what you can do with it. Deposits that are rich down here in the silicate proportion of uh, the nickel, uh, saprolite, garnierite, serpentinite, uh, typically ferro-nickel processes of smelting. Uh, Karen process has a slightly broader range, and then the more clay-rich, you know, limonite, uh, gersite deposits higher up in the, in the deposit sequence. Nearly all laterites have this profile development to some extent, it's just what the relative abundances are of that various portions of the profile dictates your process route. And this is where the acid leach processes come into their own. Nickel laterite resources around the world, tonnage versus grade. Uh, one thing that laterites do have go for them is economy of scale. They are very large deposits by and large. Uh, we're sitting well out into the hundreds of million ton range with reasonable grades for limonite deposits. Uh, typically you know, anything over a percent, 1.2 percent is looking interesting. Uh, with the saprolite deposits, the ferro-nickel smelters, they do tend to be fairly small, although there are some standouts, uh, Saraco, uh, Bahodapi, uh, Centra, Coniambo, another one, very high grade and relatively high tonnage. But these tend to be smaller and higher grade because the ferro-nickel process does require a high grade of nickel material for the smelting. And as I said, the global distribution of these is very much uh, concentrated into tropical weathering environments or paleo-tropical weathering environments, preserved deposits where at the time of formation it was for tropical conditions. And the distribution is relatively well understood. Uh, maybe some places in South America, some places in Africa where there is some residual discovery, but then you have uh, other issues for around uh, uh, ESG and various other things like that as to whether you can actually do anything with them. But they are fairly well understood where they are and where to find them and there isn't a lot of exploration upside. What are nickel sulphides? Uh, nickel sulphide's a fairly simple definition. It involves magmas that are derived from melting of olivine in the Earth's mantle. That is the ultimate source of nickel, is olivine in the Earth's mantle. And these come to surface in either two deposit types in broadly, commodiate types, which we're very familiar with here in West Australia, and the soliate hosted types or intrusive hosted types, which the rest of the world is probably more familiar with and, and we're not quite so familiar with here, even though we do have some good examples in Nova, Nebo Babel or Savannah. Uh, simple sulphide assemblage, pyrotite dominated iron sulphide, pentlandite coming off, exolving from the pyrotite, copper, chocolate pyrite as at least a minimum, and then some deposits if you're lucky, if you're in that sweet spot, you also can develop fairly significant PG, gold and silver credits. So you do get very good byproduct credits from nickel sulphide deposits. Uh, globally, there is very good residual prospectivity for exploration. 
uh, for nickel sulphides. And we're seeing some of this even uh, this week with the announcement that we saw from Legend Mining and the Albany Fraser. So there is very good uh, prospectivity. Uh, open pit or underground mining, uh, we've mined them to significant depths if they're rich enough. And they have a fairly typical process route of flotation, smelting and refining. And it's a fairly well understood process route as a lower capital intensity and very much lower capital risk than uh, you see in the laterite right deposits. Um, not a lot to see in this graph, just said that what we see with nickel deposits, they form across all geological ages. <coughs> and they form across a variety of geological terrains. So this means that prospectivity around the world is actually significantly fairly high if you understand the processes that form these deposits. So there is very good exploration potential, it's just a matter of spending the money to look. In terms of the deposits themselves, and one of the main takeaways from this graph is, is that most of the significant deposits out there in terms of tonnage and grade are old deposits. We're dealing with an industry that is significantly ageing in the nickel sulphide industry. Thompson has shut down. The Reels Camp has been in operation for 50 years. Sudbury Camp has been in operation for almost 100 years. Camp Balder, we've left the mining of resources. Uh, the junior company is doing very well out of that. But in terms of finding something of that scale in the Camp Balder Camp, it would be very, very remote. Uh, Voises Bay, the ovoid deposit is pretty much mined out. They're going into deeper mining, so, so the easy wins there are hard. Um, and Pechenga in uh, Russia going for 60 years, and Jinchuan in China has been going for 60 years. So, we, so the problem that we're facing with nickel sulphides is, is that while they have quite significant deposits out there, these significant deposits are old and ageing and looking to be shutting down in the near future for quite a few of them. So published global nickel production uh, in 2018, we had something like 2.3 million tonnes of contained nickel metal was uh, produced. And the, produce, the projection chart here is pretty much a proxy for deposit type as well. So Philippines and Indonesia excluding mining of laterites, Russia laterites and sulphide, New Caledonia laterites, Australia laterites and sulphide, Canada exclusively sulphide, China exclusively sulphide, Brazil laterites, etc. And the rest of the spread here is either laterite or sulphide. So, so the company and, and production of metals is, is a fairly good proxy for, for the uh, deposit types as well. So the economics of the nickel market. Just looking at a, a 2019 cost curve curve uh, SP Global, um, the cost curve is fundamentally split very, pretty much in terms of deposit type as well. The lower on the cost curve here are predominantly sulphide based operations. Higher on the cost curve of predominantly laterite operations. I should mention that this is reported operations, which represents probably something like 60% of all operations. Uh, some operations uh, we don't see their production costs. But for instance, the nickel pig iron industry would sit very much in this part of the cost curve here as well. So they're relatively high cost operations, but they're just not reported. Uh, the nickel spot price. Uh, we've seen uh, nickel has historically had a lot of volatility. Uh, this comes down to what the end use of nickel is, which is predominantly stainless steel. Uh, we'll see that in the future, and, and it has been that of uh, the Chinese steel industry sneezed and nickel caught a cold. But um, recently we've had the price spike in uh, nickel getting up uh, around just over $8 or $18,000 a tonne. Uh, currently sitting uh, today's price at five ninety three. dollars um, the spike was probably nothing to do with the fundamentals of demand and everything to do with speculation on the Indonesian ore ban, uh, long positions in nickel being bought and stockpiling material, uh, and then with the announcement of the ban and um, people uh, buying out of that long position, then uh, the price started to drop back to more fundamental levels. And consensus economics and various uh, other forecasters see a long-term sustainable nickel price for 2019 and 2020 at that $5.90 to $6 a pound range. So the price we see at the moment is the long-term sustainable price for that uh, period of time. Looking at warehouse stocks, uh, since around early 2018, we've seen drawdown of nickel, and this is a fundamental drawdown based on demand. So, so it's a real drawdown. A uh, bit of a spike here with um, uh, coming up with the Indonesian nickel ban, and then the fall away here is actually more to do with stockpiling material by Chinese end users. So it's not anything to do with nickel but truly being taken off the market, it's nickel being put aside against a rainy day. So that's why we're still seeing falling drop, 
uh, price in a market of falling material. Bit of an uptick here. Uh, this uptick has more to do with the long positions in contracts uh, being sold off in, in return for going back to short buying positions. End use of nickel, like I said, uh, something like 68 to 70 per cent of uh, nickel goes into the stainless steel market. And at the present stage, the use of nickel in batteries sits at around 3 per cent. But that's going to change. If we look at uh, electric vehicle nickel consumption in terms of the car companies and uh, the battery technologies that they were using at the time in 2017, uh, we see that the dominant single metal in a, in a battery production and the preferred technology is nickel. If we take that forward in terms of uh, how the technology and the battery technology is changing, we've heard about the NMC 811, so that's 8 nickel, 1% cobalt, eight, 8 parts nickel, 1 part cobalt, 1 part manganese. The preferred technology is changing more towards that end of the battery market, simply because of the, the, the energy density you can get into the battery, the trade-off versus weight. And uh, we see that by 2020, something like 80% of the preferred battery technology for most of the battery users is uh, going to be nickel metal. So how does that then marry with electric vehicle uptake into the market? If we look at how electric vehicle sales are projected to go out into the, into the medium future, say five years out to 2025, uh, there's something like 90 million uh, EVs total in the, will be on the ground operating by 2025. Something like uh, 14 million EVs will be sold every year by 2025. If we look at how that uh, pans out in terms of um, penetration to the overall market, then uh, 14 million EVs sold by 2025 represents 14% of all vehicle sales. And that's across most jurisdictions, the increase, but uh, predominantly in Asia Pacific and predominantly in China has seen to be where most of that take up is going to be. If we continue that trend out to 2035, then 14% of all the light vehicle stock and 30% of annual sales is projected to be electric vehicles. And that 14% share of all vehicles by 2035 represents something like 275 million electric vehicles operating on the ground. So when we look at how that's then going to affect consumption of, of metals, uh, electric vehicles, uh, the battery cathode market in, in the preferred technology is nickel sulphate is the product that's used. Uh, so nickel con sulphate consumption is going to rise. And so by the time we get out to 2025, we see something like a 500% increase in consumption of nickel sulphate uh, and the lion's share of that taken up in the battery market. Now, to produce nickel sulphate, there's two options. You take a high purity nickel product, such as class one nickel, which is over 99.9% .9 nickel purity, and then you put that through a process and convert it to nickel sulphate. Or you can primarily produce nickel sulphite, and you'll hear uh, some companies talking about how they're going to do that in their process plant at their mining operation later today. But the, the message to take away from this is that in 20, oops, let's go back. In the current market, as I said, 70% of nickel, 70% of that 2.3 million tonnes of nickel is taken up in stainless steel. By the time we get it to 2030, something like 30% of all nickel will be taken up in the battery market. Now that 30% of all nickel, right, this is uh, nickel pig iron, ferro nickel, class two nickel, and class one nickel, will start to rival the current market we see in stainless steel. If we look over on this graph over here, in terms of projection of, of the class one market today, this is the total production of class one nickel. At best, uh, a conservative estimate of how much of that class one nickel that goes out into the market today, we're almost hitting it, or we're well surpassing it. So this means that electric vehicles could take every single piece of class one nickel out of the market uh, by the time of 2030. So that means every other end user out there that uses high quality nickel would have to either be highly competing with it or more supply needs to be found.
And this, this illustrates it in terms of uh, where we currently stand at the market at the moment with a slight deficit, or slight uh, surplus, I should say, of class one nickel product. But by the time we get out to that projected 2030, there's going to be a significant deficit of class one nickel. Now, class one nickel can't be produced by every nickel operation out there easily. And so certain operations that are far more amenable producing class one nickel and others where it's a bit more of a struggle and far more expensive. What's the impact on the nickel price of this? At the present moment, we're sitting here. The price is actually in line with what the forecast think it should be at the current time at 2019. But by the time we move out to 2018, or, and sorry, in 2029, we're looking somewhere around a base price of nickel at around $18,000 a tonne. Now, given the pressure that there is going to be on class one nickel supply and nickel sulphate supply based on the EV take up, we could start to see a fundamental shift in how nickel is marketed. Typically, nickel is marketed as straight as LME. People pay LME or they pay a slight premium above LME for a high quality product that they trust and rely on. Given the significant deficit we're going to see in class one nickel, we're going to start seeing, I think, this being the base price of nickel that feeds into the standard nickel industry, but electric vehicle nickel for high quality purity product should attract a far significant premium above that given the scarcity that there's projected to be. We'll also start to see end users starting to partner more directly, I would say, with producers to guarantee supply. So what are the sources of that future supply? Well, going back to how we said earlier that uh, in the laterite profile, the process route dictates what you can do with it. That also applies to the electric vehicle market in class one nickel or nickel sulphate. Acid leach processes can produce class one nickel and can produce acid uh, nickel sulphate uh, relatively easily. Uh, and as we go down the ladder up profile and the, pro the material that we're dealing with and how we're processing it, we're essentially decreasing the amenability as we go down that profile of producing class one nickel and we're significantly increasing the cost of producing a class one nickel product. So by the time we get down into this part of the spectrum down here, technically it is feasible, economically it may not be so. But as we said earlier, uh, the ferro-nickel process down here is a reasonably robust, reasonably well understood, but still relatively capital intense process, but the capital risk is moderate. But the further we move up into this process from historical uh, materials that we've seen in, historic, in historical uh, operations, there has been significant capital risk and significant budget overruns in producing h plants around the world. So the trade-off is you can produce class one nickel product, you can produce nickel sulphate with an acid leach process, but your capital risk is commensurately higher as well. Nickel sulphates, um, as we said, it's a relatively simple process route and it's very minimal to producing class one nickel and or nickel sulphate products, but we do have the problem of aging mines and very little in the way of new mine discovery recently. And the mine discovery that we've had has been an order of magnitude scale less than the current producers in terms of uh, tonnage. But there is good residual potential for significant discovery. But to meet that demand that's coming up in as little as five years' time, the exploration work needs to be done now. It's, uh, it'll be too late in five years' time. So to have a mine that's online with capacity to be able to meet that demand, now is the time the money needs to be spent. Thank you.